a non-relational, self-producing space, unbound from the constraints of a regime of causality. As such, it has come to symbolise an image of freedom from law, a pre-political state of infinite and dynamic uncertainty, openness and flux. However, as we know, this figuration of the infinite remains tied to particular axioms and paradigms of meaning that constrain art towards an ideal functionalism. This predilection for the paradigm articulates a spontaneous philosophy of artists, where despite the promise of a radical unbinding from normativity and the status quo, we see it reasserted in its own terms that are compliant, conservative, and unable to think beyond the existing set of conditions that define human agency. A concept of art is figured at art's moral, aesthetic, and spatial center as the category of the uncategorizable, or the self-satisfying pleasure that we can call the crisis of crisis. Aesthetics and philosophy have shared and produced the same paradigmatic reading of the artwork, and in doing so have forced a particular ethics of artistic practice that we understand now more than ever to define the normativity of critique. If such paradigms of aesthetics and philosophy are not a necessary form of power for images, then could we consider how images without paradigm could register power in material form? What would such power constitute and what are its consequences for both society and art? What concept of the image would refuse an organisational, moral or spatial impulse? What we must ask here is not simply a question of how art produces or generates thought, nor how thought produces the sensory, such internal observations on the rhetoric of the image, whilst being pertinent, instead must be understood in the context of a larger problem. Can we approach the thought image without a theory of difference that has overdetermined its organisation and identity? So this question leads me to ask how any concept of the thought image can accommodate the concept of its political shape and operation without reference or doxa that encodes the image to systematic information. This is a question of how a science can be understood with the image, that is, without tra transcendence, idealism or vitalism, and without the predilection to condemn the image as a representationalist problem. Such questions demand a rethinking of both aesthetics and philosophy, the thought that thinks both, and the implications of concept as connected to the operations of image force. Okay, so they're the kind of problems I want to try and deal with here. And it's clear that the dimensions, spaces, and epistemologies that define and locate artistic critique share a common parlance with certain theoretical strategies encountered in philosophy, and that this uh, commonality in it, they idealize certain methods that critique must be performed, and they also figure um, a way in which a theory of critique must be based or taken up. The ethics that have um, substantiated and underscored uh, been through this philosophy of art has secured the political foundation and social habits that we recognize today, and here we can see the following tendencies that are the legacy of a particularly avant-gardist and rational conception of a politics of aesthetics. So just to move through these really quickly, um, we have one that's spatial. The artwork is made distinct to the political field, and because of this achieves ascendancy in the political and for politics. So we see this in theories of autonomy and heteronomy. We have an aesthetic um, issue, the less visible or more virtual an artwork is, then the more freedom it accrues to escape the ruthless normativity of a dominant system. So here we have the kind of privileged idea of an aesthetics of ambiguity or in aesthetics. And um, there's also a moral issue. The, this is that the artist understands that the consistent and prevailing mechanism of power is governmental policy and statist interests. So this is a theory of the individual private first imagined and then pitted against a standardized version of the public and collective. So, in the face of that, a concept of art that is capable of producing another attitude, image and thought, is challenged by exactly those methodologies um, that have situated critique. A background theory that organises difference is privileged in all of those cases. Art, understood as the presentational image, is imbued with essential alterity. 
and the image, understood as representational or interpretive, is seen as something that hampers the natural access to the real in itself. As such, it is this innate special quality of the image that acts as a bedrock for its essential political claim. That art is free for freedom. It is free to enlighten us too, as well as to generate an hitherto concept-free alterity. This form of freedom in presence alone is achieved by affecting a mechanistic isomorphy of the innate character of art as language upon the social. For art to become that bulwark against any perceived political dominance, it is exclusively tied to the real. It must coalesce with the concept of itself as being always already free, abstract and pre-political. It must assert its particularity as image or language in general. This desire for self-abstraction is art's own nature myth, where the image is conserved as the thing that cannot be thought. If we understand this from a political perspective, this tells us that when understood as actualized presence, the image is in fact considered to be weak in its power to affect social change, since the image abides by the normative system in which it operates and is essentially passive or banal. So taking this into consideration, this dialectic that I'm describing witnesses the shift from the designation of epistemic categories towards a general ontology of art in the image. This politics of aesthetics is a mixture between an ontology of real inconsistency and an ontic category of its spe specifically consistent form. The image is set in a combination of the mystical and the empirical. The thought of the image is chaos, its actual presentation is order. And this dialectical framework has embedded itself as the primary paradigm of artistic critique. Here, this assertion of a real that exceeds the space of representation and art's occupation of it has consistently and incorrectly been the place to found a politics. Now, I'm going to just throw in some artworks here just to... People always say to me, name some artworks then, who are the ones you've got a problem with, and it's most art, really. Um, but out of some examples, I could say that the people who were doing this, um, you could say Elm El Green and Dragset, for example, Andrea Fraser, um, Jeremy Della. Um, I could just go on and on, but there's, there's lots of artists who would o occupy that site of um, privileging the image as alterity in order for it to have actual political effect as they see it. But what is perhaps more remarkable in this instance is that the thought of the image alone is enough to create world change. This hierarchy of thought over the image reminds us that as material in the world, representation is the manifest constraint that this theory seeks to be free from. Essentially, for art to do its work, it must abstract itself from itself and achieve freedom from the problematic ideality of representation. It must become abstract thought. The concept of image as mediation, as culture, then becomes the dominant target of and the victim for the undoing of actual material power. And this is whether we associate the image with abstract or particular power, the specifics of actual governments, people, or the nebulous flux of global financialism. So clearly, this obsession with art's ability to achieve the promise of its own abstraction as a strategy for a politics seems like a distraction, since it refuses to account for the ways in which images operate as non-passive, truth-producing entities, namely how the mediated image is generated through reality. Ironically, what we are looking at here is how culture is set out as the site of a more forbidding nature. Culture figures in excess and a type of nature that must be challenged by grafting a theory of the image to the organic dimension of the real. All science is destroyed at the level of the inorganic dead space of the image. It can never account for the spectacular horror of the image. And what is the most banal to us is now rendered as the most strange. So here the operation of critique is consistent with enlightenment as the passage towards self-knowing. It is the mark of our self-obsession, but also the mark of a kind of narcissism that delights in the fact that we will never truly know ourselves. The face in the mirror is the ultimate stranger and we enter the horror genre. The location of the thought and image of instability 
This operate is the key signification for a particularly human crisis of power and knowledge. And for Adorno and Horkheimer, capitals and culturalization of the masses to the jitterbug, Rockefeller's sociological research on advertising that Adorno worked on for some time, albeit with bitter Adornian contempt, um, and collective consumerism produced a crude, barbaric and miasmic nature, a mimetic false reality in a totalized experience. And this false nature is fought in their critique by a transcendental reason that can overcome the false image. But it is here where a deeper mysticism of reason is invoked, opening the door to another form of horror. This vision of transcendent autonomy by which critique can claim its reason has turned upside down, but nevertheless retains its structural integrity in theories of embodiment and affect. Here, the instability of subjective identities is made central to an inesthetics or an aesthetics of sacrifice, a becoming one with nature and a radical disembodiment. Space, borders, and territories collapse back into the cosmology of the infinite, and ideal structures are incorporated into sensation. Art here is the category of a real, unstable nature. It is the manifestation of chaos, temporary relations, and the random contingent universe. It is part of the continuum of a nature force a deep self-producing creative generator that orders without sense. However, we can see that the attempt to coalesce the image with thinking, a thinking over thought, there is a re-standardized idealism that further territorializes space with a spiritualism of a more aggressive form. And moreover, this disp dispossesses creativity to the condition of a private psychological and facile expressionism. And again, I'm gonna mention some artists who do this. Ernesto Neto, Olafur Eliasson, Mike Nelson, just to name a few. This is a self as nature that privileges sets of decisions, identifications, Mike Nelson's gonna kill me, and observations for nature. And we see this whatever way around art's critique is claimed. What can on the face of it be seen as a traversal from a critique of the space of culture understood as the terrain of dominance to the comprehension of culture as having access to a real and infinite nature as freedom is in fact no journey at all. This understanding of the mediated image as the key to a reality behind or beyond itself is a story really familiar to the story of artistic critique. Here we see that art's critique is always already defined in relation to itself as a form of nature of whatever real or irreal kind. So in that sense, critique is tied to the instability of the context in which it operates. And importantly, both these accounts of critique suppress the image. The only possibilities that are offered in this instance are that the image is capable of representing things as they appear, or it is connected to an aporia of a pre-established harmony. As such, the image is a self-suppressing economy, is identified as our exemplary form of critique. This means that art can only be about art. This is the crisis of crisis that art's critique has enjoyed for way too long. So it is by claiming these spaces of nature that art has found its voice and has taken up residence. And art has apparently had the keys to the door to these other spaces for some time. And I don't know why or how it's managed to achieve that in, as its special case. So such distinctions between what is claimed as a scientific terrain of philosophical inquiry and the world of image language are common and are connected to this terrible habit that I've described. And we see this in Quentin Meassou's After Finitude that is compelled to identify the world of images to the space of a regressive, folkloric, sentimentalist regime, whilst idealizing the thought that thinks the primacy of the real at the same time. But we also see this in Louis Altice's Spontaneous Philosophy of the Scientists, where the claim is that, the only, that only philosophy can exercise the vigilance required to oversee and police our predilection to belief. And art's destiny is its ornamentation of bourgeois households. In such case, art is always already a spontaneous philosophy, and there is nothing we can do about it. The concrete assertion here is that there is and must be a dichotomy between sensation and conception and science must be set against the spectacular and irrevocable combination of orthodoxy and the image. 
This perception of a disconnect between the presentational image and the scientific image has exacerbated a form of tragic parlance of the image and a tragic conception of the political, where the image as artwork is left to narrate its own downfall. And you get this a lot, say, in the culture of Philistinism in the 1990s, specifically in the UK, in YBA art. It's a really kind of strong discourse over the 90s, this kind of post-punk self-annihilation of aesthetic and critique. And this is the perpetual crisis that Althusser repudiated for philosophy, where philosophers lapse into the role of priests. So if this self-narration of one's own downfall is not tragic, it is psychotic, a self-producing ontological relativity in an infinite regress towards the paranoic. This is a dilemma that Donald Davidson was careful to point out in his essay, The Inscrutability of Reference, where Davidson acknowledges our predilection to produce naive realisms that render this hall of mirrors if we persist with a background theory of language. Tragedy is located in ethics of the real by underscoring the myth that we can recognize our finitude by staring into the depths of the infinite and in fact structuring our relationship with it. The desire to open the doors to a real concept-free alterity ends in underscoring the paradigm of the human condition as tragic finitude. So in the face of these perennial issues encountered in a politics of aesthetics, we must consider now how we might understand the scientific image as part of the same terrain as the manifest image, the sensory and mediated realm of our encounters. Here we should be thinking through the problem of how although art seems obviously capable of generating thought, or even doing philosophy, when explored according to these strategies that I've described, art fails to generate a real critique of those systems as bad habits, i.e. we persist with a conservative critique, and it is also incapable of traversing the paradigms that define critique as we know it. As I hope to have shown, the problem of transcendence autonomy, as well as the attempt to manifest a concept of a thinking image, demonstrate an inability to conceptualize the scientific image as part of our linguistic and experiential domain. Can we experience the world in the same register in which we conceptualize it? And how would we think this adequation without a correspondence theory? The administration of artistic practice in this way restricts the definition of art to a specific morality, which is categorized by the task of becoming political. The problem here is that the very category of the political is claimed as recognizable and achievable. It is misunderstood and overdetermined as a spatial and aesthetic concept. This apprehension of the political has been indebted to artists, writers, and philosophers who deal with art, the gallerists and agents that deal art, and the institutional networks that show art. How can we conceive of a practice that does not substantialize these paradigms on the same contradictory and conservative terms is the test for art now, I think. Francois Laruelle's non-standard aesthetics and non-standard philosophy attempts to acknowledge and yet overcome the paradigmatic methods that I've mentioned by subjecting them to the power of a universal science. The question that remains here is how these non-standard philosophies and non-standard aesthetics trump those standard forms that I've been describing without philosophy. Furthermore, how we characterize philosophy here remains central. My approach to this characterization, centrally for the paper today, is to define the problems of philosophy as the persistent attempt to think the primacy of the real without producing the real as correspondent to thought material. The failure here is marked in an inevitable return to the articulation of a circle of decision. The circle that is drawn by a set of decisions that inscribe our desire for a scientific objectivity, but which are bound to the culture of habituated knowledge. As such, philosophy as a genre problem is figured centrally by the challenge of thinking the thought that thinks the real without idealism, transcendence, and reference. In many ways, then, Laruelle's task is very much a philosophical problem, and I'd also say his answer is a very philosophical response as well, even though he says it's the opposite. Um, it is about the potential, potentiality for a form of difference that can only be purchased through refusing contingency as a paradigmatic correlate to thought for difference. And at the same time, to dislocate those grounds of refusal 
in a more radical unbinding of relations. So at what level do we account for the category of difference that this theory requires? A difference that refuses an account for difference, concept without difference. Now, in a kind of segue, we can look at Richard Rorty's neo-pragmatic literary turn um, because I think it pushes just some of these errors home. Here in Rorty's thinking, belief is secularized in a politics of private irony, just as the liberal state secularizes belief in civil society as a form of work on the self. This organization of fideism merely compartmentalizes its universal claims to the temporal and the specific, whilst naively establishing its own tolerance as universal dominant abstract power. At the same time, Rorty's adjustment of turning culture into a form of science and politics into culture does not escape, nor does it change, the hinges of such definitions. The idea of culture as a science allows culture to fantasize that it can escape the fact that it is habit-based and habit-producing, a site of radical freedom, whilst retaining the order of the folkloric at the level of the political. So I hope that it's clear that these descriptions tell us that we are dealing with a problem of reference as well as a problem of relation. For Laruelle, both aesthetics and philosophy are now subject to a larger principle of a chaotic non-relational law. It is through this science that Laruelle anticipates the traditional formations of an individualistic subjectivity to be destroyed in a radical non-identarian schematic of generic man. With the promise of generic man, we also have generic philosophy and generic art. That is, a set of categories that exist without identarian reference in a non-dialectical unilateralism that is also, strangely enough, given this protracted science, a very human interest and a very human dimension. It is here in this human interest where we identify certain ontological claims to be recuperated. So perhaps we can then return the question from how Laura Wells' theory might compromise those other ontologies that he targets towards a question of identifying those that are central to his theory. How does this non-philosophical science as a practice understand its relation to the metastructural background of quantum force that has promised a more radical and imminent ethics? So this question must be understood in Laruelle's case within a conceptual framework that on the one hand seems to promise a radical equality of the human and therefore a type of politics then that can be accommodated in the given, and yet also conserves a concept of the non-political. This non-standard political or scientific moment in itself risks a pragmatic naturalism that would turn such a complex refusal of existing structures towards an unapologetic and ignorant affirmation of the status quo and a new ontological normativity. On the other hand, we can ask, is the generic matrix, in the end, an intolerant matrix with its own standards set within the assertion of another naturalism? So these questions um, ask us to look squarely upon the politics of our metaphysical and metacritical traditions and to see if their diagnostic realisms can anticipate and even cope with the presentational and mediated image. If anything, the task here is not only the demand to rethink artistic critique, but go further than that towards the need to radically reorganize what we understand art to be and its dominant referent, the name art. This is to comprehend the image as force without doxa. This means that we must reconsider the referential categories of art as our references and to examine how the production of art challenges the notion of reference in itself to itself. In other words, it must be understood as a relation that is unbound from itself. Laruelle's understanding of how the image produces identity in a, in a universalizing sense and is not directed to a thought of world further corroborates the productive, imaginative, and generative force of the thought image that threatens any standard form of interpretation. He says, it is an absolute reflection without mirror, unique each time, but capable of an infinite power ceaselessly to secrete multiple identities. So as I've described, it is endemic to art standard critique that it operate in a self-conscious modality. In other words, that it must constantly modify itself as paradigm through a doubling that relies upon a philosophy or a theory of itself as nature or as this essentially unstable category. 
This is a self-referentialism that is traditionally required in order for art to be understood and characterised within the category art. So if the name art is defined by its operation, that is called critique, and I believe this to be its dominant category in neoliberal culture, then another comprehension of art's critique is required. Perhaps even this demand might return us to the Althusserian problem of another spontaneous philosophy and uh, another spontaneous aesthetics, the weak necessity for the strong paradigm, and the production of that Althusserian circle that we remain constrained to articulate. So Laruel argues in the concept of non-photography that the circle that Altus's SPS theorizes need never be entered in the first place. And in fact, the idea that we should think that we are always already in the circle and that a philosophy need work through it in order to overcome it is more evidence of another spontaneous philosophy. All philosophy is spontaneous. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, is employed as the promise to annihilate the rational burn of a particularly historic perception that persists within decision to unbind the types of synthesis that generate various dyadic forms and their resolution. However, despite Laruel's claim, he understands that a circle remains, and this remainder must be met in a kind of expanded phenomenology that refuses reci reciprocity between man and world. Here, philosophy remains a subject, but the process that thinks philosophy is based in quantum mechanics. Philosophy must be free from thought to think. Laruel's comprehension of quantum power means that it cannot be applied to cases. Rather, the image as non-photography is adequate to the real. The concept here is one of underdetermination. Concept is reason without cause. Image is cause without reason. However, it remains to be seen how Laruel's work understands the production of typologies in his theory say between the quantum mechanics that is untied from a figuration um, of, the, of its infinitude and a type of philosophy that persists in figuring its central paradigm in the form of a standard method. These observed distinctions between process and method, between thinking and thought, highlight how this processional mode of thought struggles to traverse the paradigm of philosophy as method. The argument against philosophy, therefore, distracts from the claims that are asserted in non-philosophy, that is the deeper question of how we might think the adequation of the real and the thought image, and what permits the construction of this adequation. So despite these issues, I think it's still engaging to think through Laruel's work, since he aims to deal with the image as equivalent to a science, and I still find that kind of an engaging prospect. Even so, this writing, that Laruel's work, really struggles to say anything in particular about art, which is perhaps more frustrating in its attempt, as it really doesn't need to. However, most of these arguments about philosophy tend to leave art cold, and perhaps more accurately, I think they leave art out in the cold. Art's biggest achievement in most of our cases that I've described would be to be taken seriously, to be taken as seriously as philosophy takes itself seriously cannot think a little more ambitiously than that. Of course it does, and it can. So remember that this small aspiration for art to be considered as philosophy is in the majority a philosopher's fantasy. So what seems most pressing to deal with is how art and philosophy share the same problems and perhaps the same egoistic tendencies. Here, and now looking to art as my example, we can raise the question as to how and if a correct understanding of art might have any effect on its systems, standards, and operations that it seems to aid and abet. These, as we know, are the systems of a luxury market, neoliberal consumer capital. Here we must ask if any refiguring of critique can only be construed as tinkering with language, as another work on the self that actually supplants one commodity form for another. This dilemma urges us to look at how the manifest image permits and actually promises such a science, rather than offering the thought of the world that we perceive as its correlate. To take the image seriously is to understand how images exact force as concept and insinuate new languages that require new comprehensions of what it is to think and to know. This is not a modification of art under the name art but an interrogation, traversal, and a leaving behind of the name itself. 
the name as we know it. This is to understand its power of semblance through a practice that operates as representational action, as a force that meets us. How an artwork can effectively participate in such a transformation is then an interdisciplinary project of what I kind of call a new scientific realism, where any concept of art can locate its force that grasps relations in the structure of a type of montage that builds its direction without ground. This is a leaving behind of the category of the uncategorizable, an unraveling of a politics which requires an order of ontological and non-ontological dimensions, and an overcoming of the fear of representation towards an opening up to a groundless reflexivity of the image. That's it, thank you.